place at Matches Fashion Townhouse. Uh, my name is Christopher Morenci, and I'm the editor at large at High Snobiety. And as part of the In Conversation series at Matches Fashion, we're speaking to DeVoe today. It's the New York based men's and women's wear line um, founded in 2016 by Andrew Breen, or Matthew Breen, and by Andrea Tsao. Um, and then in 2017, Tommy Tan, the photographer, came on, came on board and he was in charge of the Women's Wear launch, and he's been in charge of the creative ever since. And I think a good way to start off with you guys is maybe to define your roles in the company today and to introduce everyone to who you guys are. Maybe you start with you, Matthew. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Matt Breen, uh, co-founder with Andrea, and I generally run the business uh, of the brand at this point. Um, my name is Tommy Tan, and I'm the creative director of the brand, and I oversee the creative direction and design of Devo New York. Uh, my name's Andrea Sao, and I'm also a co-founder along with Matt, and I do uh, design operations, a little bit of sales. Yeah. She's she the glue. She runs she everything. She runs <laughs> She's the one. <laughs> I think when we think of DeVoe, a lot of people know it from the past couple of seasons, I think since Tommy came on board, but the real story is that it started off a few years back, and I think it's good to explain to everyone, um, for you, Matt, how it started and its origins and how it also tied into your, your previous job. Sure, so in my previous life, I owned a retail store called Carson Street uh, in Soho, New York City. And uh, I was the buyer for the store, and season after season, it started to get hard to find clothes that I wanted to wear that I thought the consumer should have. And so I approached Andrea in 2015, um, and she worked for a brand that I carried at the time, and we started kicking back and forth the idea of bringing something new to the market for men um, high-end, high-quality, uh, great fabrications, um, and something that at the time, with all the streetwear and kind of loud logos and branding that existed, um, we thought would be a nice counterbalance to offer. And so um, while, we're, while still running the store, we kind of started the formation of what would become DeVoe, and we launched our first collection in fall of 2016, and at that point it was men's only. I just heard just before when we were upstairs what DeVoe actually stands for. That's quite a nice story. Sure, quick story. Uh, my great-grandfather, when he emigrated from Ireland, uh, was quite poor and ended up getting a job as a chauffeur for the DeVoe family in Philadelphia. Um, and so as a sign of gratitude, he named my grandfather, gave him the middle name DeVoe, and then got passed down to my dad. And now my niece currently, who's now I think she's eight, uh, her first name is DeVoe. So it kind of represents this kind of, you know, rags to riches story and, and really kind of the quintessential American dream. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a nice story. And Andrea, when you started in the business, I think you were at Michael Bastion before this. What was the business like back then? Um, so I think when we first, when I first started working in menswear, it was kind of the peak of that preppy American menswear. Um, and I think American menswear at that time was very strong. Um, there was a lot of really amazing brands. Um, that were doing great things, a lot of made in the USA stuff, and uh, the quality was very high. And kind of as those years wore on, things kind of started to change, as we mentioned. Um, and so that's kind of where Matt and I started getting talking. We felt like there was a lot of great European brands, a lot of great Asian brands that were kind of doing this really luxurious clothing for men that was very democratic and that guys wanted to wear. Um, and so we felt like we needed to provide basically the American answer to that type of aesthetic. Um, and so now we're starting to kind of see the tides change and we're kind of starting to see this, what, basically what we do, uh, pick up more and more. Mm. And then Tommy, you came along, I think it was 2017. Yes. Um, and you know, a lot of people know you as one of the first street style photographers outside of Fashion Weeks around the world. But you know, we were speaking about this yesterday. If you look at the time before that, you actually had your roots in fashion zone already back in Toronto back then. Could you talk a bit about you know, what it was like that time and how you ventured into fashion? Uh, I, my initial aspirations to work in fashion uh, started when I was 13. So I guess like most people, when they, have a de they develop a passion for fashion, they want to be a designer. Mm -hmm. So I initially wanted to be a designer, and then I realized it's too hard <laughs> in Canada. I was like, I already spent a lot of time schlepping rolling racks and doing all the errands that an intern would do, and I realized this is really too hard. So I, I, I set that aside for quite some time. Um, fast forward to 20, when was it? 2007, that's when I started shooting street style, because um, 
it was a it was a gateway to start meeting all these people outside the shows, um, and I was very shy, so it was just a great way to interact with people. Um, but then, fast forward another 12 years, I just thought, you know, I've been doing this for so long. I thought maybe it'd be nice to work in another aspect of the industry because mm -hmm. it's not really brain surgery. So um, I thought I'd apply <laughs> all this demographic research that I had watching everyone outside the shows, and um, I'd been friends with Matt and Andrea, and they'd always. Um, invited me to the studio just to comment on how they were doing and my advice to them was you know like if you're gonna start a women's collection you can take me on board if you want I'm willing to volunteer myself so um, I mean I was, I was lucky that they're willing to take someone with no design experience and someone that was just really passionate and wanted to be a part of the team so because what was the response at the time when you joined because it was quite an unconventional choice I think if you look at you know the black and white yeah I mean well, I mean, we didn't, I didn't announce it to anyone until the first collection had been released. I mean, I don't think there was really a, a reaction. Everyone mm. was just like, good for you. <laughs> I mean, no, people were very supportive of him. And there was some people that were surprised or like, this came out of nowhere when we were yeah. like, here's the collection. And it's designed by Tommy. And everyone was like, what? The photographer? Yeah, I, think, I, I think people definitely have their reservations because, you know, if you don't come from a formal school of training, people are going to think, oh, you know, you were spoiled or you, you cut the line. And there are people that work very hard at fashion design school that it takes time for them to finally get into a design role. So the fact that I was able to come into this creative director position and, and lead this team was kind of, it was quite a fast track. But um, I think it really comes from a point of view. And if you have a, a vision, I think from there you can really lead a team. And mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of questioned whether or not they thought, I thought they were on something because for them to allow me to come on board was quite a shock. But um, no, I, I'm so grateful they entrusted me to, to become the creative director. So. And Matthew, what was it that you saw back then? Because we were just talking about this upstairs as well. The business had been around for a few years. Um, you felt as if the business needed a new creative point of view. There was so far you could take it. And what, what was it that you felt that needed to change? Right. Uh, so Andrea and I you know, started with the vision that I had mentioned before. And, and we really took it, honestly, as far as we could go or as far as I could go. And I think that we both kind of recognized that we needed like a really strong point of view with a strong personality. Um, and luckily, we were friends with Tommy. So when he kind of volunteered that he wanted to do women's, I went home that night to Andrew. He's like, yo, Tommy's going to do this for us. And it was great. Um, and, and, and it helped that we kind of shared the same viewpoint in terms of what we thought was uh, needed in the marketplace and what we both really loved about fashion. And so it kind of was a natural marriage at that point. And, and it really was nice to have a new, strong point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and people respect his point of view coming into it was really helpful um, to help elevate our brand and the message. Because mm -hmm. we were talking about that yesterday, that I think you shot, what was it, 2 million images over the past, oh, over the past yeah. 10 years? I'm, I'm sure it's that. It's, it's that or more. It's definitely more. Way more. <laughs> that, yeah. uh, and you, know, you see all your subjects in the images, both the men and the women that attend Fashion Week. You know, to what extent did that influence you know, your sense of style? My sense of style? Or for, you the, for DeVoe, for the brand. Oh, for DeVoe. Um, <laughs> and yours. I mean, I, I mean, I have zero sense of style. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I think f for a designer to be able to see your clothes out in real life, I think that makes a huge difference. And it gives you a better understanding of fit and proportion and what works well on a man or a woman. So even though I wasn't seeing my designs out, out in the open, I was watching how people would dress and what works on different types of bodies and ages. So taking that experience and being able to apply it to this role, which uh, the aesthetic of the brand is quite minimal and very focused on luxurious American sportswear, I think that's why it made sense to be able to take all that experience. And what did you gravitate towards? Like what caught your eye over those over the past decade of shooting people? Oh, it's changed. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's gone from being, I was gravitated towards when I first started, I, I loved the whole London new rave scene. Like, mm -hmm. I tried to get into Boombox, and I couldn't get in. But I was still <laughs> shooting people outside the, the club. And then I used to wear Jeremy Scott and wear makeup. and With the wings on the shoes. Yeah. No, I actually didn't have those. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but then watching people and the way that they dress has totally changed my viewpoint and how style should be. And, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone is, is free to dress how they want. But for me, I think what's more fascinating is seeing how someone is more comfortable in a uniform. Like, if you like to wear, you know, a tailored jacket and um, 
simple crop genes, I think that's quite interesting when someone's comfortable in a uniform. Mm -hmm. So with DeVoe, it was focused on building an investment wardrobe or a uniform for someone because, you know, we're not a, a huge design house and we're not trying to make elaborate evening gowns or Savile Row tailoring. We're just trying mm -hmm. to make really beautiful, well-made, everyday clothing. And then we look into Women's Wear, which launched, I think it was the end of 2018 during your fashion week. Yes. You know, what was the idea behind that? Because it's been a menswear brand up till that point. And then when you came on board, Women's Wear was, I think, one of the first big projects that you guys implemented. You know, why was there the need for that for the brand? Can I answer that? <laughs> Andrea. <laughs> um, I think what we were seeing was a couple of really important retailers that were selling a lot of the men's clothes to women. And mm -hmm. I think at that time, specifically, because we had a quite a strong boutique business with these great retailers, they were having customers come in and request smaller and smaller sizing, or women who wanted to try the tailoring and different things like that. So we knew that eventually that would come calling. And Matt and I both had backgrounds in men's. We both were more familiar and comfortable with men's stores, men's construction, everything. Um, and so we knew at that time we needed to do it, and it kind of worked out perfectly, because Tommy mm -hmm. was able to sort of come in and say, hey, the two of you who are like always at your computer, always at your desk, like here's the perspective from on the street where I've been shooting or outside shows, and this is what I think is missing, and this is where I think the DeVoe woman should be. And I think, Matt, uh, I think you mentioned this. We were kind of trying to find, we were kind of trying to dress the guy whose wife shops at, say, mm. the row, or who's, you know, we're kind of looking for that guy. And I think the women equivalent of that guy was actually kind of, easy for us to figure out because it was something that we had been drawing inspiration from already. Yeah, I think from a business perspective too, with women's, we, again, we started in men's and so that was natural for us, but it was always the idea to go into women's at some point and at the end of the day, the women's market is just so much bigger than men's, even though men's is probably growing faster um, on a percentage basis, the women's market's just huge. And so when Tommy kind of volunteered to help us spearhead women's, that was the natural time to really, all right, let's mm -hmm. give this a go and see what happens. Because that's what I wanted to ask. What's the split today between men's and women's? Um, for us, it's about 75, 25 women's to men's. Um, again, men's will always hold a place in our hearts and our DNA as a brand. Um, but the women's business, even in going into our second season at mm -hmm. retail, um, is already far outpaced the men's, and we continue. We think that's probably going to accelerate as we move forward. It was interesting. I, we were speaking about this earlier about the split between the retailers buying into men's and women's. It's it's not often that one retailer buys into both. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it, it's quite rare, and it, it's nice because it helps us kind of tell a cohesive story. As Tommy said, it really is a uniform um, for you know for a wardrobe for mm -hmm. a very long time, and so for them to kind of tell both sides of the same story is obviously helpful for us mm -hmm. as a brand and getting our message out there. I, I look at DeVoe as kind of this, you know, this antithesis of you know, this maximalist fashion that's been coming up in the past couple of years, which we tapped into earlier. You, know, you have the Gucci's and the Balenciaga's coming up in the mid-2010s um, and the Vetmas, and you know, DeVoe takes you know, the completely different side of that. You know, Tommy, what was, what was the reason that you guys didn't follow that route instead, where arguably would be maybe more sales at the beginning? Um, <laughs> we Tell the real answer. <laughs> no, there is no real answer. The, the answer is there's, there's just a void. We felt that there was a void for just classic American sportswear, but a little bit more elevated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, with Phoebe gone at Celine, there's a void now for a lot of retailers to fill that void. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, and also there's, a, there's this shift in the New York fashion scene where obviously there's a lot of emerging designers, but a lot of those emerging designers, their aesthetic is a little bit more eccentric and maximalist. And for us to focus on our strengths, which is more about uh, fabricating beautiful, well-made clothes, mm -hmm. I think that was the goal. Um, I think it's also personal. I mean, mm -hmm. the way we yeah. dress. And the way we the way we like clothes and the brands that we love and follow, I think it's great for us to be able to kind of take something and spend a lot of time on it. And people don't realize that because they might look at, let's say, a pair of pants or something and say, okay, that's pretty easy, mm -hmm. you know. But the truth is, we sort of toil and overanalyze every single thing about it, even though it might seem simple. And so, like pants, shirts, even these things like for men's that seem like quite simple ideas. You know, that fabric was one of 40 that we were narrowing it down to. And that fit was, like, done two or three times. So these, these are the kinds of things that, like, 
when we really can hone in and focus on them, we feel really proud at the end of it. And I feel like these are the clothes that people can wear for years and years and years. I think that's the common misconception is that the clothing itself is quite minimal, but I look at the pieces and I see quite a lot of American workwear you know, influences in there as well. And I know that you guys produce in the U.S. And what's the importance of keeping that production cycle homegrown? I think a big part of it is kind of like us being control freaks in one way. Um, there isn't a single piece. Like we just started working with a very, very small boutique warehouse last season because we had to. Every mm -hmm. single piece that gets shipped out is seen by one or two or three members of our team. Every factory is being visited every single week. You know, we have a really hardworking team that's there all the time. And because the, all of the wovens are made like 35 minutes away on the train and all the knits are made in LA, we have kind of this ability to work very closely with them and feel proud of the factories that we work with. You know, I think it's quite easy for to move everything abroad and to move everything to get higher margins. And obviously, higher margins is something every business needs. But I think at the end of the day, we know all the products intimately. Mm -hmm. And we know all the steps it took to get there. And we feel good about bringing that business, especially to New York, where the garment district is getting smaller and smaller. So there's people don't realize there's a lot of amazing factories, especially in New York and in LA, which used to have big businesses. They used to make every major US brand mm -hmm. Ralph Lauren, like all of these me mega million businesses. And now it's kind of dwindled and it's gone smaller and smaller and smaller. And so what, what we've kind of done over the past few seasons is find these amazing factories that can do incredible things and just sort of keep continuing to work with them and grow with them together. And I think that's a relationship that like I can't speak like enough to. Um, it's, it's really something that's like very, very special. It's crazy, obviously, because it means a lot of hard work from us and our team, um, but I think ultimately we can see the product and when we see it online, like we feel really, really good about it. And the consumer itself, I look at your shows, um, and I remember someone from my old job telling me that they cried at the last show uh, in New York. You know, it was Stephen Galloway doing the choreography and you had someone amazing on the piano as well, and the set design, you know, it felt so different than a traditional runway setting, essentially. Now, what's the importance of, because I think it was also people between 13 and 82, if I'm correct, in the shows, a lot of people were street casted, cast on Instagram. You know, that's the way that fashion is heading now, that it's way more inclusive and it's, you know, everything can't be as traditional as it was in the past. Now, what's the importance of kind of going against that, Tommy? Um, well, with it being our first uh, men's and women's official show and, and me working for DeVoe, it was important to send a message out that was about inclusivity. And also, we just wanted the show to be reflective of our customer. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't actually know our customer, but you never know who's going to buy the clothes, right? So, um, I mean, I've been to a lot of shows in my lifetime. And um, I, I kind of get bored seeing the same format of clothes going up straight and down. You can see it live stream or straight away online. So we just thought, how nice would it be to create a very intimate setting, slow the pace down of the show, and give our audience an opportunity to really see the clothes up close and, and see it move. And also see the models just be very interactive with each other and smile. I mean, how often do you see a model smile on the runway? Um, but also just see a sense of human emotion connection um, between the models. Um, and then a lot of the models we just found based on the stories behind them. Like, they were either a custom tea maker by day or a yoga teacher or the, the host at the standard grill, you know, like but it's just being able to give them the opportunity to be part of a special moment. And what's the importance of, you know, presenting the person that you cast as your consumer as well? Because when you cast a certain persona, essentially you're looking at the end state as a consumer as well. Like that's ideally the consumer who you have in mind. Now, you guys were talking about street casting and Instagram casting. What did you guys gravitate towards? You know, what made for the right? devote man or woman? Just someone that you looked at and you aspired to think, oh, I would want to age gracefully like that person. Mm -hmm. You know, like, that's for me, having stalker syndrome as a street style photographer, you know, I look at these people and, I, and I'm envious of them because they're just so confident in the way that they are and they just wear clothes so effortlessly. So we just thought, why not emulate that into our show where the people that you saw in our clothes, you wanted to be that person and and you felt like, oh, that's me, or I want to be her, so, or him. So. Is that something that we can expect in the next couple of seasons as well, that, that same notion? Uh, 
yeah, I would hope so. If, if we went away from that, then we're obviously betraying our brand ethos. Yeah, because yeah. you were talking about that earlier, that you had a number of retailers saying that you need to go more street, essentially, to cater to their customer. Yeah, and this kind of goes back to the to pre Tommy era and when Andrew and I were really trying to find our footing with the brand, it was, you know, the sales for most stores and um, e-commerce sites was coming from streetwear and, again, some of the bigger fashion labels that were, you know, maximalist and lots of branding. And, and it was really hard for us as a brand that was just starting off to hear this feedback that we were, you know, put beautiful clothes on the rack, really high quality and really believed in them. And people are saying, you know, this just isn't right right now. And, and, try and staying that course was tough. And at some points, we started to sway a little bit. Um, and I think uh, when Tommy joined, he's like, no, you guys are right. Or, and, and I agree with it. And then he really just took it and ran with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's helped that obviously the, the trend has started to come back to just really beautiful clothes. But how do you keep that authenticity? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's not, e it's not easy. It's definitely a struggle because you obviously want to be authentic and true to, like, what you saw when you started and, you know, everything that you believed about the marketplace. But at the end of the day, it's a business, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, thankfully, we were lucky enough to, to be able to withstand a couple of seasons finding our footing um, until we really took off. But, I mean, in the beginning, it can be really tough for any new brand or new designer to kind of go out and do something that's a little bit out of their comfort zone. Because how do you how do you stay relevant in you know today's day and age with so many brands, there's so many influencers, so many... So many journalists, so many editors, how do you kind of cut through that noise? Especially with clothing that might be perceived to be more minimal and less in your face. I think it's just kind of about building our community. Like who are the people who are the people out there that are like us, who are having a hard time finding certain things that are made the right way, um, and kind of catering to them and understanding that those people are out there. And I think a big part of that is our retail partners, right? Mm -hmm. So making sure that our retail partners um, have the support and that we are understanding what their needs are and because you know I think ultimately in the end like if you're working in your little office and you're you're just designing it can be easy to feel it can feel like okay we need to be doing more of this we need to be doing more of that um, and especially when you see so many things like for instance Instagram can be great but it can also be very distracting right and so I think for us you know sticking to what we know sticking to what we really like a lot of the times on our mood boards every season, it's the same images. Like for us, we know what we want. It's just making sure that we build the community around the brand, understand the customers, cater to them and then the retailers, and kind of let people know that this is what we stand by. And I think when people see the clothing in real life and they try it on or they purchase it, they understand that value. Um, it's just that now we have to make kind of make that value known to as many people as possible. And I think if we can find all of those people, because I'm sure there are a lot of them, and make them understand the brand and the value, then I think I'm hopeful that it will continue to grow. Yeah, and I think it's important that we were talking upstairs, you know, the first three um, partners that we worked with in Fall 16 are still with us today, which is great. And then, I mean, I'll never forget the real, the real day that I was like, all right, we're going we're gonna to make it, was uh, when matches... Uh, picked us up. They were like our first big account. A little for shout men. out to matches. Yeah, no, it was. Uh, no, it was. It was, it, a big it, was day. it was a big day for us, yeah. and you know, it, it's always nice to like have people believe in your brand. But like a big company with a huge, you know, worldwide following that really, you know, stood up behind you and supported you was, it was a fantastic feeling, and I mm -hmm. that I'll never forget that day. It was awesome. And you know, I wanted to end with one question: If you have to build, if you would have to build your brand from scratch again today, what are some key measures that you guys would take? out of all those lessons you learned over the past couple of years? I mean, I'll answer from the, the business side. Uh, if you think you have enough funding for your brand, double it. Um, if you think that your business plan is flushed out, do it again. Um, and just make sure you talk to as many people in the industry and, and every part of the industry, from press to PR to factories to business people to shop owners to designers. Uh, you know, people are a lot more open and, and willing than you think they might be. Um, and getting as much information you can before you actually make that leap is uh, is very important. And uh, again, we were we were lucky enough to be able to withstand some some mistakes. Um, but now we've you know we found our footing, and it and it takes time. It just mm -hmm. takes time. Tommy from the creative side, I would have said you should have consulted me from the beginning because <laughs> I would have loved those budgets. <laughs> um. <laughs> we spent a lot of money on our first one. <laughs> a lot.
lot of money. Yeah, and now I'm <laughs> facing the aftermath of it. So, no, I mean, I think it's just making sure that you're staying consistent to your brand ethos. And I think what's most important is an interaction with your retailers and your consumer. You mm -hmm. have to understand what makes sense to them. Otherwise, what's the point of creating product if it doesn't appeal to anyone? So, um, I mean, the, the press side and the social media aspect is great, but what's more important is maintaining your relationships with you know, your clients and obviously thinking about what message you have to put out there in terms of your brand. You know, clothes are clothes and that's great, but what kind of connection will people have to your clothes unless you think about it? Yeah, what do you stand for essentially? Yeah. Andrea, uh, to close the argument. I think I'm going to speak to it more from like a team and an operations maybe standpoint, and that is just finding the right people, whether it's on your team or outside of your team, to work with, and then really investing in that. I think it's rare um, to have kind of uh, three partners in a business. I don't. I think that's not something that you see in fashion that really works that well a lot of the time, and I think a lot of a lot of the reason why this has worked so well, and then as well as the other members of our team who are back there, um, is the fact that everyone understands that they're pushing all towards the same goal. And then while the three of us might approach DeVoe in three different ways, it's understanding what you're good at, being confident in what you're good at, but then also knowing where your shortcomings are, and knowing that there's someone else on your team that can pick up what those shortcomings are. So sometimes people, and I get this question a lot, which is, oh, when Tommy came on, like, what was that like for like, you guys and what your team was already doing? And I think a big reason that this works is because the three of us have such different backgrounds, and we understand how much we can do and what we can do, what we're really good at, and then also where that someone else has the expertise. And it's the same thing with building out our team, building out our factories, building out the people we work with, our press partner, all of that stuff. Because I think when everyone's kind of working in that same way, it makes the very long work weeks, the late nights, like so much better. And it also means that when we do have some, a really amazing day, like getting matches or being here together as a team or something, it makes those victories that much better. And it also makes like when we have a really bad day that we all can like laugh about that horrible thing that happened to us that one time. <laughs> and we can kind of like move on from it. And that's I think what makes, I think fashion's not an easy business. And I think when you have that, then I think it makes it feel a lot better. I think everyone would agree with that. <laughs> um, that's a great note to end on. Thank you guys so much for coming out yeah, today. I want to thank Matches as well. I heard five minutes before this chat that we're doing some questions, I think a handful of them. So if anyone has some burning questions that they would like to ask to one of these three guests, then feel free to ask. Here in the front. Um, you talked about having... um, You talked about having similar references every season. Do you see yourself moving away from the traditional season, like fashion season schedule at some point? Oh, yeah. I, I think it makes more sense because, I mean, as much as we enjoy having press and the exposure, I think it's more important to satisfy our consumer and the retailers. And I think that way, I think what's good is if you are away from the fashion schedule, at least you have everyone's attention and you're able to invite everyone to a smaller intimate presentation. That way you have everyone more focused on you as opposed to having to run to another show, which is what happened with our show I mean, people came, but they were like, that was great, got to go, bye. So you want to be able to have that interaction right after and be able to talk about what made sense to your retailer or your client. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I also think that the fashion calendar has gotten so far ahead of itself now that we're almost delivering you know, fall and summer and summer and fall, and it's just gotten more and more ahead of itself. And um, you know, depending on the consumer, some people just want to buy clothes for the season that they're in and not necessarily four or five months in advance. So you know, hopefully that can change and normalize a little bit as well. In the back, with a great, with a great bangle on her arm. Hi. Um, I'm really curious to know how you uh, make sure that you're being consistent with your brand while still evolving at the same time. Who likes to answer that one? Sounds like a Tommy question. <laughs> <laughs> how are we going to stay consistent with that? Um, oh, that's a good question. I mean, it's something obviously we struggle with, that we think about a lot. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it definitely torments us at night. <laughs> 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 Where you just, it, I mean, that, that's, that is 
the million dollar question in fashion is like, how do you stay consistent and remain and evolve? It's, it's, I think it's just really follow your gut instinct and just make sure that you are doing what feels right and you're not listening. I mean, that, that's a problem with a lot of, I guess, designers is that they get caught up in the storm of what's trendy, what's selling, what makes sense. I think the most successful designers are the ones that follow their own path and just, you know, they pave their own, their own road, I guess, so. Who would you name as a good example? Who does it well? Uh, Rick Owens. Rick Owens. Oh, yeah. A He's a very, yeah, because Rick Owens, you never know what you're going to expect at Rick Owens, but it's always quintessentially Rick Owens. Mm. And you look at his business and it's always consistent. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have time, I think, for one more if anyone else has a burning question. <laughs> Robin in the friend. <laughs> You mentioned earlier the importance of the relationship with your manufacturing partners, and um, we've also you also referenced that fashion is moving away from logo mania, and that both the way you produce clothes, but also what you produce the clothes from, is becoming increasingly important. Do you see your customers responding to fabrication in a way that it may it could become something that really distinguishes your brand in the future and the materials you choose? Is there is there a level of engagement with that sort of um, specificity with your, that you see in your customers now? Yeah, I think so. I think one of the things that people, we hear a lot is, um, I saw it online, but when I received it or when I saw it in person, that's when I understood kind of the value, which is why I mentioned earlier building that community around the brand. Because for us, at least every season, the first step is fabrication. So before we've even done anything else, before the last season's even done, it's about finding all of the fabrics that we can that we want to work with and bringing all the headers into the office and just going through all of them. And I think that's a very, very important process for us because even two fabrics that might be, seem kind of similar, they're different in a way. And I think that's one of the most important foundations to every collection. So I hope that our consumers see that that's the kind of attention we're paying to that part of the process. Um, and also, a lot of the times, we also understand you know, kind of the, the needs for a very busy and hectic life. You know, we all live in New York. We all have crazy, busy schedules. And so we think a lot, too, about the functionality. And that's something really important to us for women's as well. We didn't want the women's collection to feel different from the men's in that sense. So sometimes Tommy calls it life-proof or yes, city-proof. is it life-proof? Is it life-proof is, like, one of the biggest <laughs> things we talk about, right? Like, can you commute in it? Can you take the train in it? Can you get on an airplane in it? Um, can you fold it into your suitcase? These are all really important things that we think about because in order for it to be a wardrobe staple that you can wear every day, it's got to be something that you really do feel like is not necessarily precious to you, but that you can have and wear every day. In Andrew's case, can you go to Mexico and eat and get stains on it and then throw it in the washer and <laughs> will it be clean? Last there week, you go. I got food all over my, the jumpsuit from last season and it was great. And like this is, <laughs> this is like what we wear all the time. This is like my market outfit. Tommy's worn this. That. <laughs> <laughs> but like, so it's it's very much about like when I mean, we're testing it all the time too, and we like make sure that every single thing is like just sealed, and we've taken care of every detail. We have a bundle of fabric with us that we have to overanalyze the next two days while we're on a retreat. So it's very important. <laughs> we're going to Soho Farmhouse. We're going to Soho Farmhouse with but a bunch of fabric. With a bunch of fabric. So it, <laughs> the process is is quite intense. Just sitting there, touching and over. You know, just thinking, does this, is this going to work? Will it make sense in our lives? And will it stand the test of time? Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, guys, for coming along. Thank and you, you guys as well. Yeah. For, thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.